boldly going where no science show has gone before. The Naked Scientists. Hello, welcome to this week's Naked Scientists, and that's with Helen Scales. Hi, Helen. Hello. With Dave Ansell. Hi, Dave. Hi, Chris. And also with me, Chris Smith. Now, coming up this week, how a common virus could be a cause of high blood pressure. We'll be finding out why. Also, a new fuel for nuclear fusion. It's a form of deuterium, heavy hydrogen, and heavy is probably an understatement. This would weigh 130,000 tonnes per metre cubed. Massive. And also bee Velcro, how plants give bees a helping hand to hang on. And we'll be finding out how in just a second. Helen. Thanks, Chris. This week is also our science question and answer show. So we'll be tackling your science questions, including finding out why kettles are so noisy, how rewritable CDs and DVDs work, and whether the Hubble Space Telescope could see astronauts' footprints on the moon. Thanks, Helen. And on the subject of what's up there above our head, in this week's Kitchen Science, I'll be showing you how to weigh air, or some of it, with just a set of scales and a vacuum cleaner. I own a plastic bag, and I'll be doing the experiment live on the show very shortly. Thank you, Dave. And if you'd like to get in touch with us here at The Naked Scientist to send in some questions or some answers, our email address is chris at thenakedscientist.com. The Naked Scientist podcast, powered by UK Fast, the UK's best hosting provider. On the web at ukfast.net. This week, scientists have suggested that a common virus could be a common cause of high blood pressure. Now, high blood pressure affects up to 50% of people over the age of 65 in Western countries like the UK. But up until now, we really haven't had any ideas as to what causes the majority of those cases. 90% of them are said to be idiopathic. We don't know what does this. So... What a group of researchers in America have done, and this is a guy called Clyde Crumpacker, who's based at the Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center in America. He and his team have been investigating something that scientists have had their eye on for a little while. And this is a virus called cytomegalovirus, CMV. Now, CMV is a very common infection. The prevalence goes up with age. In other words, the older you are, the more likely you are to have caught it. And what's important about CMV is that it causes a lifelong infection. Once you've actually caught the virus, it finds a way to persist in the body for the rest of your life. It's a member of the herpes virus family. What this group of researchers did was to infect mice with a mouse equivalent of CMV, called murine CMV, and compare their blood pressure afterwards. And when they took a group of mice infected them and then looked at their blood pressure, they found that in the infected animals the blood pressure was significantly higher afterwards than before they infected them. So that's high blood pressure, but what about other aspects of arterial disease? Well, what they then did was to do the same experiment, but they put the animals on a high-fat diet. This is the rodent equivalent of junk food, essentially. And what they found is that the animals that were infected with CMV and fed junk food developed signs of early arterial disease that began to clog up their arteries with fatty deposits showing that the infection seems to make arteries more vulnerable to getting damaged and then the build up of things like cholesterol. So what's going on? Well the researchers studied the blood vessels of these mice to try and find out why they were seeing these effects and some interesting patterns emerged. They found that the virus was establishing a persistent infection in the walls of their blood vessels, but also it was increasing the levels of various inflammatory genes. IL-6 is one of them, another one called TNF-alpha, and another gene called MCP-1. Now, these have been linked in the past to vascular damage, things that can cause injury to blood vessels. And there was also a very interesting finding to emerge, and that was that they also found high levels of two genes called renin and angiotensin, and these are key players in the long-term regulation of blood pressure. So you could say, well, that's all very nice in mice, but is this relevant to humans? Well, to test that, what they then did was to get samples of umbilical cords because they have blood vessels in them too, and they're therefore a very good way of studying the human situation without actually having to infect people with these viruses. So they took babies' umbilical cords, infected them with CMV, and found exactly the same changes taking place in these umbilical cords. And so this suggests that CMV could be a key player in causing high blood pressure and therefore the next step will be to examine adults in the population we know that people carry this virus but try and watch what happens to them after they catch the virus and then see if they do go on to develop hypertension or high blood pressure because it's a major cause of heart attacks and strokes every single year so finding out ways to tackle the problem is really a priority that paper if you want to read about it is in plos pathogens this week dave so would this mean that in the future you might be able to make a vaccine for it or just or could you do anything with someone who's already infected? 
Well, they are looking at making CMV vaccines. The problem is that it's quite tricky. People have tried to make anti-herpes vaccines for quite a while and it's quite hard to prevent people from getting infected. But you might be able to damp down the activity of the virus once you've got it. But we do have drugs that will stop CMV. There's a drug called gancyclovir, which does target CMV and stop it growing. And it might be that intervening in people with high blood pressure with these drugs might make a difference. And I guess that's one of the key questions they'll have to look at next. Thanks. Uh, Now, for a long time, scientists have been interested in hydrogen, Um, not just because it's the simplest and smallest atom in the universe. It's the most common atom in the universe. And it's the element which fuels all of the stars in the universe. Um, This is by a process of nuclear fusion, which involves reacting light atomic nuclei, such as hydrogen or its isotopes, deuterium and tritium together to form heavier elements. The problem is that to get their nuclei to react, you have to get them very, very close together, and they repel one another, so it's very, very difficult. To get a decent rate of reaction, you either have to use a very, very high temperature or get a very high density, which is difficult because hydrogen's a gas, and compressing it gets very difficult to get these ridiculously high densities you need. For this reason, scientists have been interested in finding other forms of hydrogen, which are much more dense. One has been known for long, about for 10 or 20 years. Um, it's called metallic hydrogen. Um, this is thought to be exact, uh, exist in the centre of planets such as Jupiter, and it has a density about that of water. Now, researchers in Gothenburg in Sweden have been splitting up um, deuterium molecules using a catalyst and electric field and studying what's produced in the sort of gas by firing a laser into it. This laser will rip off some electrons from a pair of atoms, and these atoms then fly apart so they repel one another. And by measuring how fast these fly apart, you get some idea of how close they were to start with. And they've been doing this, and they've found some very interesting results. Some of these atoms are flying apart. The bond lengths must be only about 2.3 picometers, which is equivalent of a material with a density of about 130,000 times that of water. So a cubic meter would weigh 130,000 tonnes. So this is some kind of special form of deuterium. This is not normal deuterium. This is not what you would normally find. There's something else knocking around in there very rarely then. Yeah, they think something very... If it is what they think it is, it's something very bizarre quantum mechanically is happening. Possibly what's happening is the electron... Normally in a um, substance, in a solid, you have all the um, nuclei in a lattice and then the electrons are flying around them. They think what might be happening is all the electrons are sitting in a lattice and the nuclei are flying about. Um, Because nuclei have got much more momentum, that means their wavelength is much smaller, um, a quantum mechanical wavelength. That means the whole thing can be a lot denser and a lot smaller. But that must be good because if you've got something that's already a lot denser, if you want to do fusion reactions with it, you've got to work less hard to get it close together to fuse than you would otherwise do. That's right. You don't have to put in the energy to get them that close together. They're much more likely to hit each other. So, again, they've only made minute quantities of it so far. It's only lasted na- less than nanoseconds. But it might, it's very interesting. It might be a way forward with fusion. So one hopes then that uh, you just have to find a way of making lots of this stuff and then we may have a a killer fusion fuel for the future. Or maybe not a killer, just a very good one. I think that might be the challenge. We'll see. I'm going to take things back down to earth now and to the flowers and the bees. If we look around in the the plant world, we see all sorts of wonderful, colourful flowers that have evolved into great shapes and beautiful colours and smells and things. And a lot of that comes down to their interrelationship with insects because... Lots of insects rely on plants for their source of food and the plants rely very much on the insects to carry their genes around for them, that pollen, to go and pollinate other flowers. And up until now, there's been a bit of a question in the plant world and that is why why do some insect-pollinated flowers have their petals covered in tiny little cells that shaped a bit like pyramids. And until now, we haven't been quite sure exactly what they're for, although we've had ideas. But now Beverly Glover from Cambridge University, publishing in the journal Current Biology, has led a team of botanists who found a solution to what these little little cells on the tops of uh, petals are for. And quite simply, they're to help bees get a toehold. It's quite simple and really rather elegant. What they did was they went and made artificial epoxy resin flowers that look apparently almost exactly the same as real flowers. These things, you know, they're not quite the same as plastic flowers you see sitting around in a, in a dusty hotel lobby. These are actually wonderful things that look very like the real thing. And they made some with and some without these cone-shaped, pyramid-shaped cells on their surface. And they put sugar solution inside these flowers and then they let the, a load of bumblebees go in the laboratory to see which ones they prefer to go to. 
And what they found was actually that when the petals were laid out horizontally, the bees didn't really have much of a preference for the rough or the smooth petals. And they visited both of them about, about half the time. But when the petals were sloped at a steeper angle up until they were actually vertical, the bees preferentially visited the rough petals rather than the smooth ones. And their team then went and used high-speed films to watch these foraging bees and see what was going on. And they actually found out that it was indeed that their feet weren't getting a grip when they were on the smooth flowers um, held at a, a vertical vertical angle um they were sl- sliding around they couldn't keep their place they had to beat their wings really to stay on the flower while they were feeding meanwhile on the rough petals the bees found a foothold and they could settle down they stopped beating their wings and that's really important because it saves them lots of energy that they would have to use if they're still beating their wings and they want to save that energy as much as they can while they're feeding and getting all that lovely sugary goodness from the middle of flowers it's intriguing isn't it because the same team beverly glover and heather whitney about three years ago also published a paper in Nature this time where they showed those same cells also have a role as miniature solar panels. They absorb solar radiation and warm up the petals. This also warms up the nectar and therefore insects get a metabolic reward when they land there because the nectar's warmer and they showed that bees prefer their nectar warm. They'll land on flowers that are warmer compared with colder flowers because that means they don't have to waste energy warming themselves up. It's all good. And I think they have these little tiny hairs on the end of their antennae, that, which we think the bees are able to sense and they actually feel and touch which um, petals are smooth and which are rough. And, and in many cases, they prefer to go to the ones that are nice and rough because they get, get to hold on, a bit like uh, crampons if you're a mountain climber and it's easier to climb up the mountain that way. Rough justice, Dave. Now, for something a bit more technological. Well, I guess that's fairly technological, just a bit more human technological. Now, most computer and TV d- displays work by actually emitting light. Now, whether this is produced by using electrons hit a phosphor screen in conventional TVs or plasma screens or from a fluorescent tube behind a liquid crystal panel in a modern LCD display. This is great in a dark room, but if you're outside on a bright day, the sunlight completely overwhelms the light from your screen and you can't actually see what you're reading. And also, these, because you've got to make all this light, that uses a load of energy and these displays tend to be quite power hungry. One solution is to make a display that works like a piece of paper, either reflecting light from outside or not reflecting it to make up a picture. So no matter how bright it gets, you can still see what you're reading. And you're not producing light, so it uses a lot less power. Um, there are some technologies which already do this in black and white, such as the e-ink in some e-book readers, but they can only change very slowly, and so far they're only in black and white. However, researchers at the University of Cincinnati may have a solution that will give you full colour uh, video speeds um, with a reflective display. Their technology works by using droplets of ink sandwiched between two hydrophobic surfaces. Normally, surface tension pulls the ink into a droplet, and there's a little um, sort of well for it to sit in. So it pulls itself into a droplet in this well and only covers a very small proportion of the display. So the ink is water-based, yeah, the and water- that's why the, the hydrophobic, the water-hating bits push the ink away, is that what yeah, you're saying? Yeah, so the, the hydrophobic surfaces push the ink away, the ink pulls itself into a droplet in this little well in the centre of the pixel. Um, then if you apply a voltage, it gets a track, um, you, you track the ink to the top, top hydrophobic surface. That overwhelms the um, repel- water repellency and it gets spread out over the whole pixel. And so the pixel goes to the colour of whatever ink you've got. Why is this more energy efficient and more effective than the current way of doing it with LCDs? Well, the only energy you've got to put in is enough energy to move this ink around. And you're only moving it sort of microns. So it's very, very small amounts of energy. You're not having to produce any light. And because you're not moving it very far, it can switch uh, at the moment at 50 milliseconds from one to the other which isn't quite fast enough for videos but if they reckon they get the pixels a bit smaller they get it down to a millisecond which is far faster than you need it's only a prototype so far but they've got monochrome displays to work and they see no reason why you couldn't make it to roll up and so in a few years you might see it in your pocket let's hope so because i'm getting a backache carting around my laptop thank you dave now, it might surprise you to know that around the world, about one person in every 12 is actually living with a chronic infection of their liver, usually hepatitis C or hepatitis B. And those numbers totally overwhelm the numbers of people with pandemics that we're well acquainted with, things like HIV and flu. But not many people actually know about the massive disease burden that's caused by these infectious causes of hepatitis. And so to try and remedy this, on the 19th of May... What's been set up has been called World Hepatitis Day and all over the world people will be gathering to try and run events to raise awareness of this. And at the University of Birmingham, researchers, including Dr Joe Grove, will be doing just that. And he's with us now to explain a bit about what they're trying to achieve. Hello, Joe. Hi, Chris. Welcome to The Naked Scientist. So tell us what you're actually hoping to achieve with World World Hepatitis Day. Okay, so like you said, World Hepatitis Day will be a lot like World AIDS Day to raise national awareness of the problem. 
and um, we're holding an event to highlight the interesting scientific and clinical work that's done here in Birmingham. Um, the aim of the event is to raise awareness with the public um, and hopefully reach out to people to get tested. Um, also to engage with the patient community that's in the UK and to highlight the important work that's done at the university. What will you be doing during the day to tell people a bit about hepatitis B and hepatitis C? So we have, um, we have a couple of MPs, uh, Dr Lynn Jones, who's our local constituency MP, and Dr Brian Idden, who's a member of the uh, all-party hepatology group, so they decide liver policy in Parliament. They'll be coming down. We also have representatives from the local press and the local community and the patient community. And we'll be uh, giving them a series of talks to outline the uh, scientific research we do here on hepatitis C specifically, but also the work that's done to treat both hepatitis B and C in Birmingham and the clinical research, such as clinical trials that are carried out here. And then we'll be giving them a tour of the laboratories and also the um, clinical research facility in the hospital. So let's just look at the actual disease that these agents cause and why you need to raise awareness about them. Why, what are hepatitis B and C and why are they a problem? So, I mean, hepatitis um, simply means an inflammation of the liver. And over a short, if you had an acute hepatitis, that is a short hepatitis, um, that's not necessarily a problem. And viruses like hepatitis A or E um, cause acute hepatitis that self-resolve. Um, hepatitis B and C are capable of establishing a persistent infection. So individuals may be infected um, for, the, for the duration of their life. Now, um, this becomes a particular problem because if you have hepatitis over this uh, extended period of time, you'll start to get other symptoms such as uh, liver cirrhosis and possibly even liver cancer. And this, in, fact, uh, this, in the case of hepatitis C, there are up to 500,000 people in the UK with, the, with an infection, but 80% of those uh, do not know about it. So that makes it a major issue because if they don't know it, they can pass it on because these are, of course, blood-borne viruses. You spread them by sharing blood, sharing needles, having sex with people. Sure. So people, if they don't know they've got it, can pass them on. So I guess raising awareness about them in the general population is very important because that encourages people to get tested. Yes, of course. And also um, there are actually treatments. Um, it, is, you, it is possible to treat hepatitis C and you have a reasonably good outcome of treatment with around 50% of patients resolving. Um, however, if people uh, often don't seek um, uh, medical attention until the disease has become particularly apparent and by which stage it's harder to treat. So if there's anyone out there who worried that they may have been exposed, they should get tested and then they've got a much better chance of getting um, resolution to the illness. Thank you very much, Joe. That was Dr Joe Grove, who is a researcher at Birmingham University and he's hosting what will be Birmingham's contribution to World Hepatitis Day. So thank you very much to Joe Grove for joining us on this week's Naked Scientist. Lifting the lab coats on the world's best science. The Naked Scientists. This is The Naked Scientists with Chris Smith, with Dave Ansell and with Helen Scales. It's our science phone-in this week, so if you have any science questions for us, our email address for the programme is chris at thenakedscientist.com. We'll be finding out shortly how rewritable CDs and DVDs work, whether Hubble can see the footprints of astronauts on the moon, and why electric kettles make so much noise. If you'd like to join in online as well, you can listen to the programme via Second Life. We have our Second Life mansion in the Scilands. You go to Second Life and there's a whole clutch of avatars there who join in every week to listen to the show and then have a conversation amongst themselves and put in some questions too. So do go and join them if you'd like to. Helen. Well, as you say, coming up we'll be answering all your questions. But first, it's time for another instalment of Kitchen Science and we're going to be doing it right in the studio this week with Dave. So Dave, what are we up to this week? Well, this week I'm going to get some idea of how hard air pressure is pushing down on us all the time. Fantastic. And how are we going to do this? Well, OK, this experiment, it doesn't actually measure the whole of the air pressure. We'll give you some idea of some of it, get some idea of the scale of it. Um, what I'm going to do, use is get a set of kitchen scales, which I've got, uh, not kitchen scales, bathroom scales. Like bathroom scales. More okay. like bathroom Very nice scales, yeah. Bathroom kitchen scales. scales wouldn't be nearly strong enough. Um, I need a, you need a board to put on the back of them. I've actually got another bit of glass from another set of glass. Would a tray scales. do something like that? You want something pretty strong, a right. piece of plywood about the same size oh, as your right. kitchen okay. scale, something like that. And you also need a plastic bag which will go over the top of everything. 
Um, if you, I'd be surprised if you managed to get this done within the hour. Although, if anyone does manage it, I'd be very interested to hear. Okay, <laughs> anyone um, keen out there? There's a challenge. <laughs> so, okay, got kitchen scales, uh, not bathroom scales. Sorry, uh, on the board, and the plastic bag. Put the whole lot inside the plastic bag. So you've got quite a thick plastic bag. It's it got to be airtight, kind of... presumably. This wants to be an airtight no plastic, plastic bag, right. and I did as strong a one as you can get. This okay. is, came with something I bought, I think. So Excellent put to put that in there. Into there. Um, Super. I've also put some sellotape in the back of it to take up any sort of excess bag. Right. Oh, yes, yeah, so you've kind of folded it up a bit and sort of parceled it in there. Yeah. So it fits neatly. Excellent. So that's in there now. Great. And then what I'm going to do is get uh, my vacuum cleaner. Which we happen to have in the studio. Yes. I don't know. If you just do, I'm looking around. It's quite dusty, so perhaps at the end we'll do a bit of a spring clean. Basically, stuff the vacuum cleaner in the open end of the bag, ruffle up the bag round the neck of the vacuum cleaner and turn it on and measure how much force is reading on the scales. There you go. That sounds pretty straightforward, but rather fun as well. So if you have a go and you fancy having a go and you've got your, your bathroom scales, a plastic bag and a hoover, presumably a vacuum cleaner with a, a long tube, not one of the ones that you can, an upright one. That would be a bit difficult. Yeah, you want it? the tube from the a vacuum cleaner. A tubular version. I'm just trying to think <laughs> how you would get the one with the kind of rotor on the front into the bag, but never mind. So don't do that. That wouldn't be good. <laughs> And uh, if you uh, if you could, if you don't manage to do this at home, you might also want to have a think about how much air pressure is going to be pushing down on some scales. I've got a vacuum gauge to work out how hard, how what portion of the air the vacuum cleaner does pull out, so we can work out how much air pressure is that would actually be pushing down on these scales. So, what do you want people to sort of phone in and guess, or to email or text in and guess? So, basically, you've got a normal set of bathroom scales. How much air pressure is pushing down on those scales? What will, it what read? will you read out? What will the scales do? Um, the, the scales will read out. Um, a, a proportion of that, which the um, would it be a minus number then? Sorry, <laughs> well, if you take all the air away, won't it weigh less? Um, well, the the whole thing will weigh less, but the scales will be compressed by air pressure all the way oh, to above our heads. Mean. Okay, and we want to get some idea as if you can phone in and try and work out what that air pressure is pushing down on these scales. The email address chris at the naked scientist.com. What do you think Dave's scales will read? And I'll tell you for free, they, they look like they're about one foot, so 30 centimetres along each side. So they're a sort of square shape to give you some clue if you want to have a go at working it out. Helen. I've got a question here for you, Chris, that came in from uh, Jeff Fazis, who says, Why is an electric kettle so noisy? Ah, yes, my kettle is no exception. And the reason that kettles are noisy, they make that sort of thumping and bashing noise as they boil, and then the noise intensifies as they warm up, and then it goes silent as they boil. It's because of the way that the heat is being transferred into the water. So you have an, an electric element inside the kettle. A high current is passing through that element, which makes it get hot. The heat from the element is therefore transferred by convection and conduction locally onto the water molecules around the element, they then get excited and get hot, so you have a bubble of hot water around the element which tries to expand, and it also floats upwards away from the element because, of course, warm things rise. But as it rises, of course, it loses its heat again to all of the surrounding um, water. So this bubble of water and water vapour collapses in on itself very quickly, and that's cavitation, and you get a shocking, a sort of knocking noise. And so those thumps that you hear and the, and the, the, the sort of hissing that you hear is the water vapour bubbles collapsing on themselves and emitting some sound waves. That's what I'm saying. It's essentially the bubbles, that the water's boiling, forming little bubbles of steam, and as they rise up into cooler water, they shrink and collapse and then smash into each one another and make lots of noise. So it goes cooler once the bubbles get... It gets a lot quieter once the bubbles get all the way up to the surface and they stop um, cavitating, is that right? It makes more noise, I think, when I have less water, because I try and have as little as I need for a cup of tea, obviously covering the element, um, but not, not lots more to save on energy. And I think that's noisier. It could be that there's there's a bigger resonant cavity inside the kettle because the bubble makes the makes a sort of note inside the kettle, and if you've got lots of free space, then that the air will help to move around and bounce the sound around inside the kettle like an echo chamber. So that might be why you're hearing more sound. That's okay. probably what's going on. I've yeah. um, got a question for you, Helen. Here, it's from Glenn Carlson, who says, "Do fish sleep?" 
Well, we had, uh, I think Diana talked about uh, on Question of the Week a couple of weeks ago about whether fish have eyelids and they don't, so can they sleep? And the answer is yes, they can. Um, but, it, but it all sort of depends on how you define what sleep is because in humans, um, the transition into sleep involves um, changes in the patterns of brain waves in an area of our brain called the neocortex and fish don't really have the same development in their neocortical region as humans, so uh, as mammals really. So it's kind of difficult to say in the same way what sleep really means for fish but they do if you count it things like kind of a reduced metabolic rate and slowing down activity then they do seem to sleep um zebra fish which are a freshwater fish have been studied in the laboratory and if you watch them i think this is a rather sweet idea that um you can watch them during the day and they they will actually sort of doze and their tails droop down and they stop moving around at certain times of the day and they do seem to sleep um so that's one thing and uh, and in, in antarctica actually only last year they discovered the first hibernating fish um Apart from ones that sort of um, mud, mud, mud fish that, uh, that uh, estimate and keep themselves uh, alive when things dry out, the Antarctic fish actually slow down and uh, stop feeding, and their hearts rate slowed, and they used heart rate monitors on these fish to see what was going on. And we think that it was probably um, because it gets darker in the winter in Antarctica. In fact, it gets completely dark because the, there's no sun, um, and they find it hard tracking down their prey because this prey is still out there. But but they're visual hunters, and without the light around, they find it very difficult to find their food. So they sort of stop they sleep. They and they're a bit like hibernate. bears they kind of um some bears don't sleep the entire winter they will actually kind of wake up every few weeks have a little wander around find a bit of food go back to sleep again and and that's what these antarctic cod um seem to be doing as well it's quite interesting because glenn has written uh, a few things he he spotted and this question was provoked by things he actually saw himself he says a few years ago i was on a night dive in the sea of cortez and we actually think we saw fish sleeping in a number of different ways there were fish in caves or nooks that were awake but only slightly responsive. There were also fish lying on the seafloor looking like they were dozing soundly and they weren't at all perturbed by our diving lights. And there were others that had wrapped themselves in a cocoon of slime that seemed to act almost like a protective blanket. He says, I suspect they have nightmares as well because as we watched, a large moray eel swam slowly across the bottom of the seafloor, stopping to sniff prospective meals as they were snoozing and then choosing his favourites. But the moray left the blanketed fish alone, a wrasse, he believes, which he found it interesting because he said that they're eels and they normally find them quite tasty. Yes, they're, they're parrotfish and they do produce these kind of sleeping bags and we do think that it stops them being able to smell. Their predators can't smell them. But there are other fish that come awake at night. In fact, if you go night diving, you see a completely different um, ecosystem, really, because the ones that were asleep during the day tend to come out. They're often coloured red because they actually that means they can't be seen at night because uh, red colour is absorbed, red light is absorbed in the water. Um, and so you see kind of a shift change in day and night fish when you go night diving. Brilliant. Well, on the subject of light, Dave, John Gamble says, how are rewritable CDs and DVDs? made we we know that that when you burn a cd you're burning tiny pits into cds and dvds to make digital recordings of sounds and images but how can you then undo that so you can rewrite them hundreds of times a normal cd works by just having a sheet of aluminium with lots of little pits in it um you make the pits by having a glass you make it you etch a glass um thing which you push into a little sheet of aluminium that makes little bumps in the aluminium then shine a laser on it and they get reflected differently from the pits and the tops and bottom of the pits and you can read that as information and then that information gets turned into sound and you can hear it um the, the, the sheet of aluminium is a shiny thing it's um encased in polycarbonate so it's nice and protected um a, a recordable cd works by have the same polycarbonate disc and have a layer of um dye over the top um, this dye is sensitive to light, and then you have a shiny thing behind it. Um, there's various different kinds of um, dye. With different, some of them are better than others that survive for a long time. That's why you get different colours of CD, uh, CDRs, and uh, so it changes colour. Uh, oh, so when you it. zap it with a laser, rather than burning a hole in it, what it actually does is changes the, the dye configuration so that what the reader is looking for is a dark spot rather yes. than a hole. and the, the dye changes colour. And then when you come along with another laser, you can what reset the dye to its original colour, which overwrites the... I think they then hit it with a different power of uh, laser, which um, heats up to a different temperature, which then resets it, and then it cools down slowly. And so it zeroes everything, and you can come along with a second high-power laser and re- rewrite it. Intriguing. Got an email here from uh, Emil Sorensen who says, Hi guys, my parents have been telling me I should wear socks all the time or I'll get ill. 
So my question is, does having moderately cold feet really increase your risk of catching a cold or the flu? Uh, my own take on this is no, because I have chronically cold feet. But they say cold feet and cold hands warm heart, don't they? So I'm all right. But there's no real evidence connecting going out in the cold with catching a cold. It's one of those urban legends that gets trotted out. Don't go out with wet hair because you might catch a cold. The only real... Uh, evidence in this favour was there were some studies done in Scandinavia in people who were doing very severe exercise and they found that in those individuals uh, exposed to very cold extremes as well taking some vitamin C did help to ward off colds but on the whole getting cold doesn't increase your risk it's actually physically being exposed to the pathogen that increases your risk the only ex- sort of ex- exception to that is if you get very very cold and you get so cold that you get damage to your mucous membranes your linings of your nose and your mouth then of course you might make yourself if you get cracked skin or, or breakdown of the mucous membranes more vulnerable to say a bacterial infection coming in on top so you have to be careful for that but uh, there's not actually any evidence connecting getting cold or washing your hair and catching more pneumonias or colds or viruses so you're probably okay emil he goes on to say he thinks katani is awesome cat's not here this week um, but i'll tell her for you and uh, also that he'll make it an endeavor to listen to every single one of our podcasts because he highly appreciates our complex discussions that's very kind of you that's emil Sorensen, who's listening in denmark and if you want to listen to any previous editions of the naked scientist you can catch them on our website they're all there as a podcast that's nakedscientist.com forward slash podcast Bringing the facts to bear. The Naked Scientists. You're listening to The Naked Scientists. And now it's time for our technology update with Mira Synthillingham. Yes, I'm at the BBC Television Centre in White City in London with our tech expert, Chris Valance. How are you, Chris? I'm fine, although the sun seems to disappear today, doesn't it? After such a lovely week, now we're sat outside and it's actually grey and miserable, but there we go, that's British summers for you. Well, other than the horrible weather, what have you got lined up for us in terms of technology this month? Well, when the weather closes in, there's nothing better than to curl up with a good book. And of course, there's been a lot of tech excitement around the uh, launch of the latest version of Amazon's uh, e-book reader. There's a bigger screen, a lot of excitement about whether e-books are one of the ways forward for publishing. And it's not just Amazon that are in there. There are a number of other companies vying for this space. We've got Sony. We're even expecting a couple of British entrants into the market. Two e-book readers due out maybe later in the year. One from a company called Cool Er and the other one from a company called Plastic Logic, which I believe their technology has been featured on The Naked Scientist before. So a lot of excitement in this space. But publishing and technology have been, well, developing hand-in-hand for a while now. A lot of publishers are starting to get into social media in a really big way as a way of marketing books, as a way of engaging with fans. Things like YouTube, Twitter, blogging, all of that publishers are starting to embrace. I've been speaking to one of the guys, if you like, leading the charge into this field in the publishing industry. His name's Jeremy Ettinghausen, and he's the digital publisher at Penguin Books. For some authors, the blogging and going on Twitter and making videos on YouTube has given them a a, a route to get closer to their audience and engage readers outside the very specific work of their book. For those authors that do engage in it, what's in it for them? It allows them to tell readers where they're going to be if they're doing events, tell them news about publishing events, when their new book's coming out, special offers, that sort of thing. But it allows the reader to get closer to the author and that, in terms of pure kind of commercial things, can't help but sell more books. So We Tell Stories was the project where we paired up uh, authors and game designers. We had six stories running over six weeks The first one was told on Google Maps and you could follow a character as he explored uh, England and had several adventures. The last story was by Mosin Hamid, who was shortlisted for the Booker Prize last year, and he wrote a very elegant uh, take on a choose-your-own-adventure story. And the idea of, you know, a very literary, you know, prize-winning author creating a kind of detailed schematic for the structure of a choose-your-own-adventure story was absolutely thrilling. And that was Jeremy Ettinghausen talking about how social media is important for publishers. Now, what about the authors involved in this technology? Well, it's fair to say not all authors are interested in this at all, but I've been speaking to one. He uses Twitter quite a lot to engage with fans and to talk about his work. His name's Nick Harkway, and he's the author of the book Gone Away World. 
the wonderful thing about Twitter is not only is it a kind of level playing field where your readers can find you and you can talk to them and you, you don't have to worry about this concept of the fan. You can just be people talking about stuff that you like. But you can also find authors and you can track down people you admire and say, I really like you and, you know, and then feel very embarrassed about it afterwards. But it, it works very well. I think the really important thing is, is to be genuine. There are a lot of people on social networking sites and Twitter in particular who, who have their publicist kind of tweeting for them every so often. And it's very obvious and, and it's slightly disappointing. You, you can't just kind of implant the idea that they must go and buy your book into someone's head like an alien egg that you just sort of leave there and it'll hatch and you get sort of £2.99 or whatever your royalty is. You have to be there and engage in the discussion and that's probably the most important thing. And it's not limited by genre. Ben Ockrey tweeted a poem line by line the other day um, and P.D. Smith, who, who wrote uh, Doomsday Man, a fantastic book, um, is, is constantly twittering. You find everybody. Susan Hill has a weblog. It's all sorts. Are there any dangers? Yes, that you spend too much time and have too much fun. Uh, other than that, I think it's no more dangerous than taking the bus. That was author Nick Harkaway. So we've got two developments. One, the hardware with the advent of e-books, and the other, in the way in which you engage with your favourite writers, you might be able to chat to them on Twitter. You don't have to write a letter to the publisher anymore. Now, what are your thoughts on this, Chris? How popular do you think e-books will become? I don't know. There's something about the experience of having a book that's unique to the physical product, the feel of the book, the way it's published, the cover and all of that. And let's face it, you don't want to start reading your ebook in the bath. And, you know, it, books are kind of... The fact that they're slightly disposable, that you can get dog-eared, that's kind of part of the fun of a book, isn't it? But on the other hand, books do take up a lot of space. I mean, in my own home, practically every surface is covered with books. It would be a lot nicer if I could just reduce it down into an electronic format. So... I guess there are pros and cons. I think what's interesting is the way the technology is trying to replicate some of that physical experience of having a book. The screens on these devices are reflective, they're not luminous, so they feel more like paper. They're using this e-ink technology. I think the really interesting thing will be how these devices affect sales of publications and newspapers. Obviously, that's uh, magazines and newspapers having a difficult time of it at the moment. Will reading them on e-books help rejuvenate that industry? I think there are lots of interesting questions. I don't know the answer to your question. a very long way of saying that. I don't know whether they'll replace existing books. My guess is probably not. So e-books may not replace genuine uh, old-fashioned books, but they will certainly have some space, save us some space around the house. And it's great that authors can now interact with their readers. Gives me something to think about as well, because my first book's coming out later this year. Haha, <laughs> sorry, big plug there. Um, and that was Chris Valance talking to Mira St. Fillingham about the latest technology in the field of electronic books or e-books. I don't think that um, these electronic formats are quite as tangible. They're not as nice as a paper book. I, I just can't feel in, I can't bond with them the same way as I can with no you can't and you need them on your shelves and I think that you, like you say mm. um, Amazon never got rid of books you know bookstores still I mean they're obviously with the, going through problems at the moment but uh, economic problems at the moment but we still love to go and browse around bookshops don't we there's a certain feel and smell about it that we all love absolutely this is the Naked Scientist with Chris Smith with Dave Ansell and with Helen Scales uh, it's our science phone in show if you have any science questions for us then do drop us a line the email address for the programme is ever chris at the naked scientist dot we have an amazing kitchen science experiment running this week. Uh, Dave, just remind us. Basically, what I'm going to do is get a set of uh, bathroom scales, put them in a plastic bag, then pump as much air as I can out with a vacuum cleaner um, and try and work out how much air pressure is pushing down on us because we can measure how much of the air we've sucked out with that vacuum cleaner. We heard from Destiny on the forum who wants to know how does evolution produce new genes? Yes, so in other words, you've got huge panoply of life on Earth, all of it descended from some ancestor that must have got started something like 3.9 billion years ago. That's when we think life started on Earth. How do we have this massive and dramatic genetic diversity we have on Earth today? Well, the answer is that we use as our genetic material DNA and some organisms use RNA. They're two related m molecules. And the basis of evolution and inheritance is that that genetic material has to be copied and passed on from one generation to the next in gametes, in other words, sperms and eggs. Now, in copying the DNA, a job which is done by enzymes, miniature machines in cells that read a DNA chain and then make an identical, hopefully, copy of it, then you end up with faithful transmission of the gen genetic message from one cell to another. But occasionally, mistakes occur, and there are a variety of reasons why mistakes can occur. One of them is that those enzymes that do the copying make a mistake. It's like me copying a book on... I've got a book open in front of me, and I'm reading off of the book and making a new copy in a second book. I, I might miscopy and make some mistakes. 
Secondly, there are things coming in from the environment that can damage DNA. There are drugs, there are chemicals in the environment. There's also radiation in the environment. That could be ultraviolet radiation. It could be chemicals you take into your body. It could be living in Aberdeen and breathing the radon gas that comes out of the granite there. Anything radioactive that gets into your body can also damage DNA. If that happens to the cells that are making your gametes, your sperms or eggs, that can lead to mutations, changes in DNA. This can cause DNA to rearrange itself, bits of DNA can get copied or duplicated, and this means that there's the opportunity for new genetic combinations to emerge. And once they emerge, they can then get co-opted or changed or manipulated in order to do other jobs. And we know this happens because if you look in human DNA, you can find the ghosts of genes long dead hidden in our genetic closet. You can find, for example, lots of old genes that used to make our haemoglobin, which are now no longer effective, they're no longer functioning, they're called pseudogenes. But this is where we've copied the gene somehow, and then it's become deactivated but it's still in the genome now some other process could come along and reactivate that gene and use it for something else so it's a way of making genetic diversity and another way this happens is something called transposons you have bits of genetic material that can literally jump and they take themselves out of one bit of your genetic material and put themselves somewhere else carrying bits of dna with them and so this is another way of rearranging your genome and producing new forms of genetic sequences which can then become other important genes and a a final way is viruses because viruses certain kinds of viruses actually physically insert their genetic material into the dna of their hosts hiv does that other viruses could retroviruses do that and a really elegant example of this is that there is a certain sea slug it's called a sacoglossan sea slug which eats algae And when it eats the algae on the seafloor, it actually gets the chlorophyll containing chloroplasts. These are tiny bodies inside the algae that contain the green pigment that enables the algae to trap sunlight. And the slug gets hold of those chloroplasts and puts them into its own skin and keeps them alive. So the slug can also use the energy of sunlight to get energy. The interesting thing is that the slug has had to steal some genes from the algae in order to power those chloroplasts in its own cells. And the only way researchers think that could have happened is if a virus added the genes to the slug in the first place. So the answer is it's very complicated, but it seems that with nature and evolution, almost anything is possible. There you go. Quick, in a nutshell, rundown of uh, natural selection and evolution, I believe. Now, Helen, talking about sea and things and sort of oceans, marine biology, your kind of area, Beverly says, how do barnacles mate with each other? Well, absolutely. You were talking about um, sperm and eggs. And barnacles, if you've ever been down to the shoreline, are rooted very solidly to the spot. So how do they move around and find a mate? Well, lots of other marine creatures have a similar problem. Things like corals, which are animals, they don't move either. But they they solve that by um, sending their sperm and eggs up into the water and hopefully they'll fertilise and they'll meet each other and and fertilisation will take place and larvae will be created but that's not what barnacles do barnacles look a bit like um, other types of mollusk on the seashore but they are in fact a type of crustaceans they're like crabs and lobsters things like that but very much smaller and uh, but they do actually have sex um, uh, directly uh, and the only way they can do that is by having a very long appendage the male barnacles have very long penises one of the longest uh, in comparison to the size of the body that there is in the animal world, animal kingdom. and um, didn't include me in the analysis, just like to say that. No comment. Uh, <laughs> and the barnacle males will literally uh, poke around uh, next to them and see what they can find. So they don't have much reach, really, in, in actual terms, but uh, they can reach out and fertilise female barnacles. That- That's amazing. So if you look at the the barnacle crop that you see on rocks do you see sort of concentric rings of males females males you must see some sort of patterning like that indeed because uh that you would have to be arranged in space uh, around on that rock um, to be able to reach other um members of the opposite sex and they obviously mate with lots of other different barnacles to produce lots of baby barnacles um but that's how they do it and it's rather wonderful so take a closer Brilliant. look next time you're down on the shore Thank you very much, Helen. Dave, very quickly, got a question here from Roger Rorig, who says, could Hubble see the footprints made by the Apollo astronauts on the Moon's surface? Well, look, Hubble is an incredible telescope, but looking up its resolution, it reckons it has a resolution of 0.05 arc seconds. That means it can distinguish two objects which are 0.00013 degrees apart, any closer together than that, and they sort of merge into one object. 
Now, in practical terms, what does that mean? That means that uh, if something's at the distance of a moon, the, the distance of the moon away from us, Hubble's essentially the same uh, near the Earth. It's a very low orbit. So about a quarter of a million miles about to the moon. Qu- about 384,000 kilometres. That means you can see something 9 to 10 metres across on the moon. So probably not. That would be a very big footprint. Uh, Bigfoot, yes. <laughs> literally. Yep. OK, thank you, Dave. This is The Naked Scientist with Chris Smith, Helen Scales and Dave Ansell. We're answering your science questions. The email address, chris at thenakedscientist.com. Distilling the best science. The Naked Scientists. You're listening to The Naked Scientist, and now it's time to go to Diana O'Carroll for this week's question of the week. This week, what's all the buzz about the bee waggle dance? Hello. I was watching a programme on television the other day about bees and how they do a wee dance to tell the other bees where the flowers are. Now, I was talking about this with my friend the other night and about evolution, and neither of us could think of a way that the bee dance might have evolved in very small steps, if you know what I mean. Could you shed any light on that for us, please? Thank you very much. Honeybees perform a little dance to tell their nest mates where to find food, so what is it that makes this happen? I'm Andy Barron. I'm a lecturer in the Department of Brain Behaviour and Evolution at Macquarie University. So how did the waggle dance evolve? When a forager bee has found good food, she comes back to the hive, she performs a waggle dance, and these movements in the dance very precisely and symbolically represent the direction and the distance to the food source. And then other bees are following that dancer, and they read those directional specific movements, and then they head out of the hive and go and find the food. Now, what we know is that performing the dance and reading the dance is entirely instinctive. So we have to infer that this whole complex symbolic communication system is somehow programmed by the honeybee genome. Now, how a genome programs behavior with this level of complexity, I have absolutely no idea, and I don't think anybody has any idea. But there's nine honeybee species, and the dancers of the dwarf honeybees Apis floria, these are the most primitive honeybees, they have less complex directional information than the European honeybee, the honeybee that we're familiar with. And maybe over millions of years, this alerting signal was refined to add more spatially specific information, and over time, you get something as advanced and symbolic as the waggle dance. But again, look, as to how the bee genome and how the bee brain have been modified by the evolutionary process, to give bees this dance language, but really we still have absolutely no idea. But it's a great question. It is an absolutely fantastic question. The genomics aspect is yet to be determined, but we can guess at the stages of the bee dance evolution. My name is Jürgen Taoz and I'm heading the bee group at the University of Würzburg in Germany. The recruitment of nestmates to food source is very important in all social insects. Most primitive, we find this represented in bumblebees, where forager bumblebees, after returning to the nest, simply are just alarming their nestmates to give them the simple message, I found something interesting to go for, but there's no information whatsoever about the location. The next step then we find in stingless bees, so experienced bees which know where to go and non-experienced bees leave the nest together and they arrived at the desired location in groups. And then we find in the honeybees this dance language where bees inside the nest tell their nestmates through this dancing movement about the geographical location. And between the stingless bee recruitment and the honeybee recruitment, there's really a big gap in evolution. The reason why I think that the dance language, as we find it in honeybees, has evolved in honeybees and not like in bumblebees or in stingless bees, has also to do with the precision of the nest they are building. The combs make the surfaces on which the dance is formed. And these combs are extremely irregular. They hang absolutely perpendicular. So the direction of gravity inside the nest can be used as a direction of reference. Bumble nests are very sloppy and stingless bees nests, they are also not very irregular. So there would not have been the opportunity to evolve such a language in this other closely related species. Perhaps it was the arrival of a tidy nest that allowed the bee waggle dance to evolve in the first place. You need a good dance floor before you can do the bee laro. Sorry. But it's the vertical combs that allow bees to relate to gravity as a direction finder. 
Sometime in the future, it is hoped that we'll know how bee genes affect behaviour. Now, from positive evolution to something we might consider as negative evolution. Hi, this is Steve. Hello from Dubai. A good friend and I were talking the other day about a possible reversal of natural selection in today's world. She theorised that with modern society as it is, highly skilled, intelligent people are either having less children or putting it off altogether due to time constraints and lifestyle choices. Leaving those, while trying to put it nicely, less intellectually gifted, the job of providing the bulk of population growth. But is there any scientific evidence to back it up? Is it all about the breeders? Do we need to start a Cambridge University breeding program? Let us know what you think on our forum, where you can discuss your ideas for all to see at thenakedscientist.com forward slash forum or email us chris at thenakedscientists.com. Thank you very much to Diana O'Carroll with this week's question of the week. And talking about that bee waggle dance, I think they've actually replaced one intriguing question with another, which is, well, how do they know to make their combs per- perfectly perpendicular in order to give them the good dance floor in the first place? But maybe that's scope for another question another time. You're listening to The Naked Scientists. And now I think it's time for us to find out what has been going on in kitchen science. And this week, Dave asked us to get some bathroom scales. Don't stand on them. Put them in a plastic bag instead. Suck the air out of that bag with a vacuum cleaner, using a nozzle-type vacuum cleaner, not an upright one. And apart from getting a nice, clean set of scales, what have we seen? So, Dave, what are we up to? OK, so we've got the set of bathroom scales in the bag. I've actually had to slightly knobble these bathroom scales in order to make them read sensibly, because they have this annoying tendency, so they only read once you've... Well, they'll only give you one reading for your whole weight, rather than giving you a constant reading. Um, so I've knobbled them. There's how to do that on our website. So I've got them in with a board on the back... And I'm going to put the vacuum cleaner nozzle into the bag and then hold the bag up tightly round with my hands so it cl- seals it round the nozzle. I'll turn on the vacuum cleaner. I'll reattach the tube to the vacuum cleaner. <laughs> Fantastic here. I, yes, it does help if the tube does actually run out of the vacuum cleaner. He had connected cleaner. to the vacuum cleaner to the tube. Anyway, let's try that again, shall we? Okay. <laughs> now we have it connected. Try number two. Oh, fantastic. Wow. It's a... Uh, can you hear me over the sound of the vacuum cleaner? I don't know if you can, but uh, the scales are going up and up. It's incredible. We're at 140 kilos... It's going up, 100, nearly 150. Oh, I think it, I think you might have broken it. <laughs> I think you're too. I think they're not expecting someone that heavy to stand on your bottom scales. That was saying that, that there was 150 kilograms standing on the scales. Yep, the scales were reading 150 kilograms um, until I managed to get rid of the last um, gaps in my system. They overloaded the scales entirely. Uh, so what's going on? OK, basically, um, air, there's about several, many kilometres of air above our heads. Air, although it feels very light, it doesn't feel like it's only weight, actually weighs about a kilogram for every cubic metre. Um, so if you've got several kilometres of that above your head, it actually gets quite heavy. Um, the vacuum cleaner doesn't... Um, when the vacuum cleaner pulls the air out of this um, bag, it means there's less air inside the bag than outside of it. So on the outside, the air is pushing in, and the air on the inside isn't pushing out quite as hard as it was. So there's a difference in the two forces. You get an overall force squashing the two pieces of glass together. Oh, so that's why when the scales are just standing on the bathroom floor, because the air that's pushing down on them is also pushing back up when they're normally in a bag like that, you don't get any net force down on the scales. But as soon as you take all the air out, now the only, the only force that's there is in one direction, atmosphere onto the scale surface. That's right. And in fact, we weren't even sucking anywhere near like all of the air out of that. I can measure how much air this vacuum cleaner will suck out using this little gauge I've brought along with me. This looks like a fantastic old thing. It's a circular gauge showing us uh, uh, yeah, how much of a vacuum you're creating. Yeah, Let's I've, have another go then. I found it in a skip. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so I've done the vacuum cleaner on again. That's going up. We've got to about, uh, about am I reading that? It's about 700? It's, it's, actually, it's, reading, it's sucking out about a sixth of the air. So if we suck all of the air out of this bag, it would be about six times as much force as we were reading. So getting on for 900 kilograms of air on this um, area, which actually works quite nicely because there should be about 10 tonnes of air pushing down every square metre. So every square foot, about 900 kilos. It's amazing to think, though, isn't it? You've got the weight of a London bus pushing down on every single one of us, effectively, haven't we? Yep. Uh, if you include, work out all your surface area, at least that much pushing in on you. 
And who would have thought you could measure it with a vacuum cleaner and a pair of bathroom scales and a radio studio? But there you are. It's brilliant. Thank you very much, Dave. Details of how to do that experiment and uh, some pictures of Dave performing on our website, nakedscientist.com forward slash kitchen science. Now, I've got a text message here from Fran who says, do you think that all of the rockets and spaceships that have been sent through our atmosphere are responsible for making holes in the ozone layer? Well, Fran, we know that the major culprit for making holes in the ozone layer are chemicals called CFCs, chlorofluorocarbons. These are the things that were used in aerosols, even in asthma inhalers, but also in fridges as refrigerants. And they were used in huge amounts until the Montreal Treaty came in in the late 80s to try and ban them. And what provoked that was that a group of scientists, including Brian Gardner, who appeared here on The Naked Scientists a few years back, uh, had actually noticed this massive hole opening up over Antarctica in the mid to late 80s. And this hole actually grew to be the size of Australia at its peak. It's stopped growing. It's actually beginning to shrink a little bit now. And that's because we have stopped using these chemicals. The reason that they concentrate down in the Antarctic is because the Antarctic is an isolated continent. It's completely surrounded by ocean. And this creates something called a circumpolar current. And this has a sort of whirlpool-like effect in terms of air. And it draws in and concentrates these molecules over the Antarctic over winter when it's very dark. They then accumulate in high clouds over the Antarctic. And when the sun comes out in the following spring, the sun breaks down the CFCs and they get turned into reactive chemicals that will then react with ozone and deplete it. They're by far and away the worst culprit. We don't send enough rockets and spaceships up into space to make a huge difference, I wouldn't have thought, in the grand scheme of things. So I think, although we have to be environmentally conscious, I think the benefit of sending rockets into space in terms of what they can do for satellites and furthering research is far greater than the small bit of damage they might make to the ozone layer. So I think on the whole, probably not, um, probably more a man-made anthropogenic problem but great question thank you for that now i've got a question here for you helen which is from lee dunn who says hello i'm lee i'm emailing to ask a question that no one that i've asked can answer for me not even my science teacher and the other teachers at school how does photosynthesis occur under water that's a great question um but uh, fundamentally um photosynthesis actually began in the oceans in underwater because uh, that's where plants and algae first evolved they then moved on to land so um light definitely gets into the upper layers of the ocean and that's where the process of photosynthesis traps that light and converts it into energy into car into carbohydrates really that the rest of the food chain relies on so um it's really the idea is that plant life algae has to maintain itself in the in the upper layers of the ocean because once you get further down into the depths of the ocean, first of all, red light uh, gets absorbed, which is why the oceans look blue and greeny colours. Um, so uh, it it light does get down there, but it has to maintain itself up in the high level. So if you look, for example, at coral reefs, um, they have plants living inside their tissues, well, algae, um, and... Uh, those those types of coral have to maintain themselves by growing on big reefs, uh, depositing calcium carbonate in great big layers that build up and build up. And as sea levels rise, they have to keep up their pace to keep themselves in that lovely, sunny, gorgeous bit of the tropical oceans where we all love to go snorkelling and diving. But as you go deeper down, they tend to peter out. And there are some types of coral, actually, that don't have photosynthetic algae in their tissues. They actually rely on catching their food like other animals, and they, they catch it from the water. And those are the ones that live deeper down. So we used to do see the so nation, you see similar things on the beach uh, with different types of seaweed using different types of pigments to to harness light, both in the sort of open areas where there's lots of light, and then sl- do- lo- lower down where light starts to get absorbed. Is that why seaweed is sort of reddish coloured because um, it doesn't absorb red if it's deep underwater? Blue light can get all the way down, so it absorbs blue but not red. Some seaweeds are red seaweeds. That's right. That's a, that's a kind of branch of of the algae, and they have different types of pigment that do. Uh, yes, they use up the green and the and the blue lights, and red is is a reflection back and that's why they look red. So the bottom line is that basically there's very little difference between the photosynthesis that's occurring in the oceans and the photosynthesis on land because it's all the same process. It's just been tweaked a little bit to make use of the light that's available and there's slightly more light of different wavelengths available out of the water than in it but the bottom line is it's pretty much all the same. It is and it's very important in the ocean. So much photosynthesis goes on and carbon dioxide gets fixed in that process in the oceans and we know that's really important too. Of course because the oceans are the biggest carbon dioxide sink of of the whole planet, aren't they? Now, Dave, got a question talking about gases and things. That's a perfect link because Nick Brown has emailed us to say, why do we store propane but not natural gas? You see people having propane tanks outside their house to to run their, their gas fires and things. Why don't we have big tanks for natural gas? We have to rely on that coming down a pipe. 
it's all about boiling points, really. Um, if you look at the lot, the bigger the molecule, um, the higher temperature it will boil at. So butane will boil at sort of minus 0.1 degrees centigrade. So um, you don't need very much pressure to keep that as a liquid at sort of room temperature. So you can have really quite weak light tanks. Um, propane boils at about minus 42 degrees centigrade, um, which means you have to have... 10 or 12 atmospheres of pressure to keep that a liquid at um, 40 degrees centigrade. Um, but that's not difficult to make with a small light steel tank. Um, and so it's quite practical and you can carry it around, perfectly sensible. Um, nat- uh, natural gas is methane, um, which boils at minus 161 degrees centigrade, roughly. Um, and to keep that a liquid at um, all the temperatures you'd have to, you have to have tanks which are strong enough to um, survive 200 to 220 atmospheres of pressure. And from the experiment we were doing earlier, that's going to involve about 2,000 tonnes of pressure on every square metre of that tank. So it's going to have to be made out of incredibly strong steel. It's going to be very heavy. It just makes it expensive and impractical to carry around and very dangerous to carry around in vehicles. So that's why we have it coming down a pipeline, but we don't store it locally. We use propane much easier to compress and get lots of it into a small space in a tank. That's right. The pipeline never has to be at a very high pressure. You never have to liquefy it. Brilliant, Dave. Thank you very much. Well, that's all we've got time for this week on The Naked Scientists. Thank you very much to our guest this week, Dr Joe Grove from Birmingham, and also Chris Valance with our tech update. And thank you also to our production team, Diana O'Carroll, Mira senthard and Ben Valsler. Next week, we'll be finding out all about the science of the skin. Join us to find out why we do have colours of black and white and how it all works, where they came from, and how all the races of humans on Earth actually evolved in the first place. We'll also be finding out how you heal skin without scarring and why some people can't make pigment at all. If you've got any questions on any of that, send it to us now, chris at thenakedscientist.com. Thank you for listening. Have a great week and see you next time. Goodbye. The Naked Scientist podcast comes to you from Cambridge University and is supported by the Wellcome Trust, the EPSRC and UK Fast. For more information, look us up online at nakedscientist.com. Listener.